I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honey. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm very happy today, but I'm also worried. Well, this is a strange situation, worried and happy at the same time. Well, it may sound strange, but please let me explain. You see, I'm going to have a holiday from school this week because it's Thanksgiving. Oh, yes, it's gobbler turkey time, and all the little boys and girls will sit down around the table and gobble the gobbler. Oh, that's silly, gobble the gobbler. <laughs> but it's so true. Yes, it is. And I hope you remember that Thanksgiving Day is a day to be thankful for whatever good things have come our way. And it's good to remember to think about the people who don't have things so good. That's a very nice thought. If everybody remembers that, then maybe they'll find a way to help people who need help. Yes. And now tell me, what are you worried about? Well, I I'm very worried about Flash Gordon, especially, and Rusty Rowley, because they're not having so good. No, they're not. So I'd like to see whether they get any help. Well, I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out some music for Bailey the Beetle. Today, Beetle Bailey and his pal named Killer Diller, because he thinks he's such a lady killer, are in town on a pass, enjoying a day away from the army. They're sitting in the park, watching two workmen raking up the leaves. But Killer is mostly watching the girls who pass by. And then, last picture top row... A beautiful blonde with two dogs comes toward them. Beetle says, Nice dogs. And Beetle's pal answers, How the heck with her feet? Look at those legs. Wonder how she's fixed for dates. And he jumps up and stops in front of a girl. How to do, beautiful? I wondered if... Oh, yes. I was looking for someone to watch my dogs while I go over to the drugstore. First picture bottom row, Kaler says, Ah, don't worry. I'll get a date when she comes back. Just then a squirrel jumps out of a tree <laughs> and runs past the dogs. And he says... Which means... Last one up the tree is a green-eyed baboon. And away the dogs go after the squirrel. <laughs> Killer yells, Whoa, oh, hold! Hey, quit it, will ya? Hey, stop! Stop, will ya? The dogs run past the tree, one on each side. And Killer is pulled smack into the tree. The force of the collision shakes thousands of leaves down onto the clean grass. And one of the park attendants cries, Look what you've done! Messed up our pretty lawn! And the other one points his sharp-pointed stick at Killer and roars, Pick up those leaves! Yes, every leaf! Killer drops to his knees and starts picking up the leaves. Last picture, he looks up to see... <laughs> Beetle, who has caught the two dogs, handing them to the pretty blonde. And then he sees the pretty blonde kiss Beetle. <laughs> And hears her say, How can I ever thank you for rescuing my little pets? Mm -hmm. And Beetle goes, Duh, somebody turned that squirrel loose again. <laughs> Wasn't that funny? <laughs> yes, you bet it was. Killer, who thought he'd make such a big hit with the beautiful blonde, ends up on his knees picking up leaves from the clean grass. And Beetle gets the beautiful blonde. <laughs> yes, that's something that doesn't happen to him often. Well, now you said you were anxious about Flash Gordon. Oh, yes, I am, because he's on the planet Venus, and he was captured by King Stang, and last week he was in terrible danger. Well, let's go to Flash right away, then. Turn over the page and go past Prince Valiant, where little Prince Arn is brought back home by Boltar and Tilikum, safe and sound today. Then turn over page three, go past page four, turn over page five, and there, on page six, is Flash Gordon. Yes, and you remember last week that King Stang had sent Flash out into 
the forest to guard Queen Vicky against the blue ones, who are some terrible big creatures with many arms like an octopus. Yes, like an octopus. But in spite of all precautions, the blue ones killed one of the guards and frightened away all the other workers, leaving Flash and Vicky alone in the forest. And Queen Vicky got so frightened that she ran away to her jet plane and started to go away, leaving Flash all alone. I wonder what's going to happen next. Well, let's read now and see whether Flash saves Queen Vicky from those terrible creatures. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega, rega, doon, doon, sashkamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Queen Vicky guns her jet car to escape from the jungle clearing. Suddenly, Flash sees the blue monster shoot its tentacle into the air and stop the car. The jet car is held motionless in midair. Flash catches onto a vine hanging down from a tall tree and makes a run, then swings himself into the air aboard the jet car. But then the blue one lashes out at Flash. But a swift burst from Flash's chemi spray gun loosens the monster's death grip. That last picture top row, suddenly freed from its weird anchor, Vicky's car springs up and forward. Flash barely manages to get a grip on the car as it speeds away. He shouts, Hey, slow down! Give me a chance to pull myself in! First picture bottom row, he manages to scramble into the cockpit. Vicky tells him she's sorry that she got panicky. But Flash replies grimly, Well, I'm not so sure you really are sorry. But there's no time to argue about it. There's a storm just ahead. On Venus, storms move with supersonic speed. And it's only a matter of a moment before the jet car is caught in the vortex of a raging whirlwind. Again, the queen gives way to blind panic. Flash quickly takes over. <laughs> While Vicky clings to him in terror, Flash calls upon all his skill as a pilot in an effort to ride the wind currents downward toward a sheltered landing spot. Because if you're fighting nature on a rampage, you're up against the most terrible enemy in the world. Yes, because there's nothing stronger than a wild, wild wind. Well, we'll find out what happens next week. Oh, look, across the page, there's Robin Hood. Yes, Robin Hood. And remember last week, Robin Hood and three of his men, disguised as the Sheriff of Nottingham's men, had gotten inside of Prince John's castle at Nottingham. And they rescued the main Marion from Prince John, who would locked her up in a cell. Yes, but Robin Hood still faces a big problem. How to get out of the castle with the maid Marion before someone notices them? Oh, yes, because the sheriff can give an alarm or something. I wonder what will happen. Well, let's read now and see whether Robin Hood escapes safely. Here we go with the story of Robin Hood. It's merry, merry England and days long ago. Time now for Robin Hood. So music, hi-ho! <laughs> With Prince John locked in the cell from which Marion has been rescued, Robin Hood, Little John, and the Maid Marion have joined the two men who have been guarding the Sheriff of Nottingham. Standing on the steps of the castle, facing the courtyard, Robin says to the Sheriff, Now, Sheriff, you alone remain to hinder us. The Sheriff replies, Oh, spare me, I pray. I swear upon my honor as a knight I will not cry out, if you will but spare me. All right, so be it. Then give the order. Give the order to lower the drawbridge. Fourth picture, top row, the sheriff cries. Lower the drawbridge! Last picture, top row, as the angry sheriff watches, the maid Marion and the three of the men mount horses. Robin says, Now when the drawbridge is lowered, ride out in good order. I'll follow when you'll be on bowshot. Robin watches, first picture, bottom row, as his men ride out of the castle with Marion, who casts an anxious glance back to Robin. The sheriff stands silently by, hatred written on his face. When Marion and her escort are out of bowshot, Robin mounts his horse. He says to the sheriff, You know, sir, sheriff, I hold you to your nightly vow to remain silent until I've gone. Robin rides for the gate. The sheriff stands silent for a second, then steps forward and shouts, Halt that man! Last picture of the two guards step into the entrance of the castle as the sheriff shouts, Raise the drawbridge! No, he hasn't. He vowed by his knightly honor that he would keep his word to Robin Hood, and now he's broken it. I don't trust him. Oh, why didn't Robin make the sheriff go along with him and then tie the sheriff up and leave him in the bushes in the forest, and then Robin would have gotten away safely? Do you know what's wrong? What? Robin didn't have you with him. Thank you. 
but, but I wonder what will happen to Robin now. Well, we'll find that out next week. But now let's find out what's happening to Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, goody, I just love that Dagwood. The funniest things happen to him. Very well, let's turn to the first page of the second section of the Comic Weekly. And here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Ram a food, am a fum, zim zam zombie. Can you be music for Dagwood and Blondie? Blondie and her two children, Cookie and Alexander, have just finished painting the kitchen table and the kitchen chairs. And Blondie has decided that they won't be able to eat at home tonight. So last picture, top row, all dressed up for a nice dinner, they go out of the house. Cookie asks, Where are we going to eat, Mama? Blondie replies, We'll pick up Daddy at his office and eat supper in a restaurant. First picture, second row, Mr. Dithers walks into Dagwood's office saying, I can't get my work done around the office. There are too many interruptions. A terrific idea explodes in Dagwood's mind. Let's finish it at my house. It's quiet there. Last picture, second row, Dagwood and Mr. Dithers come into the Bumstead house and go into the kitchen and stop before the newly painted chairs and table. Mr. Dithers says, May I take off my coat? Why, sure. Hang it over a chair. Make yourself at home, Mr. Dithers. Mr. Dithers takes off his coat and hangs it over the back of a chair, not noticing that it's covered with wet paint. First picture, second row, he unzips his briefcase. I uh, will put all the contracts and statements on the table for ready reference. At that moment, Blondie, Cookie, and Alexander have stopped into Dagwood's office and have asked to see Dagwood. Dagwood's secretary replies, Oh, Mr. Bumstead's not in his office. He took Mr. Dithers to your house to work. Blondie, thinking of the wet paint, exclaims, Oh, my goodness. At that moment at the Bumstead's house, last picture, third row, Dithers has put his hand on the wet table, and Dagwood has sat down in the wet chair. He leaps up and shouts, Wet paint! Wet paint! Ten minutes later, first picture, bottom row, there's a... And a group of people dash into the house and into the kitchen. It's Blondie and the kids who see the table and chairs covered with papers and clothes, covered with wet paint, and they see tracks leading to the basement. They follow them. And last picture, they stop on the cellar steps and stare in amazement. For there are Dagwood and Mr. Dithers, stark naked in two tubs of water. And Dagwood and Dithers shout, Don't come down here! No, don't come down here. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that the funniest thing you ever it's saw? It's the way those two men, <laughs> cheerful as you please, settle down to work at that freshly painted kitchen table. Yes, with such big smiles on their faces. And then the look on their faces when they discovered the wet paint. <laughs> yes, there are a couple of characters, all right. Yes, there are a couple of characters, all right. Well, let's go over the page and see who's there. Oh, look, on page three of the second section is Dick's Adventures. And I just have a feeling that today he's going to begin a new adventure. Well, we'll find out in a moment if your feeling is the right one. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the third page of the second section, Dick's Adventures. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Say them with me, please. Riggedy pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. It's bedtime, and Dick has been reading his history book. He says to his mother, who steps in his room, Hey, did you know how the Star Spangled Banner got to be written, Mom? Gosh, it was exciting. It was in 1814. And then he snuggles down on his pillow, and his mother tucks him in, saying he should go to sleep. And in his mind, he goes back, back, back. And last picture, top row, in his dream, Dick finds himself in the year 1814 on horseback racing from Bladensburg, Maryland, toward Washington, D.C., the capital of the country, with calamitous news. Great Britain and America are at war, and a rampaging British army is closing in on the national capital. Dick rides into the city of Washington to find the city in panic. People are dashing about in fear, taking what articles they can to move out of the city and save their possessions. 
Dick heads for the newly built executive mansion where the president lives. Second picture, second row. Dick is talking to Dolly Madison, who is the hostess of the White House. You have to pack and leave. You only have a few minutes before the enemy arrives. Last, last picture, second row, with frantic haste. State documents are gathered together. There is scarcely time to save any of the precious furnishings except a single magnificent portrait of the first president. And then, first picture, bottom row, in a simple horse and wagon loaded with the precious documents and the picture of George Washington, Dolly Madison gallops off toward the hills of Virginia. Last picture, back in the city of Washington, Dick and a handful of grim-faced defenders stand before the White House, awaiting the approaching enemy and their country's blackest hour. This is exciting. You mean the enemy is actually going to try to capture the White House? That's exactly what they're going to try to do. And just think, Dick was the person who helped Dolly Madison escape from the White House with the picture of George Washington and all those important papers. Yes, he was. Next week, will there be a battle? Well, we'll have to wait until next week to find that out. But now, look, below Dick's adventures, there's Rusty Riley. Oh, and this I'm especially anxious to read because that nice Mrs. Jones owes that mean, bad old Mr. Marlowe a thousand dollars, and she doesn't have the money to pay him. And today is the day they have to pay Mr. Marlowe the money, or he can take her farm away from her. And Rusty, who wanted to help her, won the horse race in which he hoped to win the thousand dollars. But instead, it turned out it was only a thousand dollars in certificate. Yes, certificate. Yes, certificate. And Mr. Marlowe can refuse to accept them because they aren't in cash. I wonder what Rusty can do to save the farm for Mrs. Jones. Well, let's find out right now. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. As Rusty, Pete, and their friend Stove Pipe stand in Mrs. Jones' living room talking to Mr. Marlowe, Mrs. Jones is called to the door. She comes back into the room and tells Rusty that there's a man outside by the name of Clem who wants to see him. Rusty exclaims, Oh, oh jeepers, he's a sailor who was on that freighter with us. Mr. Marlowe snaps, Well, let him wait. We've got to finish up this foreclosure. At these words, Clem walks into the room saying, I couldn't help hearing what you were saying while I was waiting outside. Uh, seems like you boys has got a special use for some real money uh, real quick, right? Yes, that's right, Clem, but... Last picture, top row, Marlowe snaps. Listen, mister, whatever your name is, you can wait outside. We're busy with private business. Now, now, just take a reef in your mainsails, bub. What I gotta say may just fit into that business. First picture, bottom row, Marlowe snaps. What could you possibly have to say that concerns the business we have in hand? All I know is that these here lads needs a thousand dollars in money, and I'm here to give it to them. Rusty says, Well, Clem, we can't take money from you. Why, we couldn't ever pay it back. Clem smiles and takes the money out of his pocket, saying, Well, this here money belongs to you, Rusty. The owners of that trader voted to pay salvage money to all of us as state of order. They sent me to find you two in Tex and give you these certified checks. Rusty quickly takes the check from Clem and holds it out to Mr. Marlowe. Last picture, he says... Here, Mr. Marlowe, this will pay up what Mrs. Jones owes you, and more. You can give her the change. Marlowe stammers, I, I, I don't have to accept a check. Nothing doing. The sheriff steps forward. I'm thinking you do, Marlowe. A certified check is practically the same as currency. That moment, the door opens, and in walks Tex. And seeing everybody there, he says, Hey, what's going on here? <laughs> And the sheriff's going to make Mr. Marlowe take it, and Mrs. Jones' farm can be saved. Yes, you bet it can. That Mr. Marlowe had better take that check, because Tex just came in, and if he doesn't take it, Tex will fix him good. Well, we'll find out for sure next week. Now, let's turn over the page. And look, on page five, here's Roy Rogers. Yes, and you remember that Roy Rogers is with Brimstone Barlow, and he's a very funny fellow. He's big and fat and all covered with guns and ammunition, but he won't use them because he says 
He wants to reform outlaws without shooting. Yes, and Roy and Brimstone are trying to capture a band of outlaws led by the Sphinx. And they have their hideout in an old mission. And last week, Roy and Brimstone had captured two of the outlaws and had told them that Roy and Brimstone themselves were outlaws and wanted to join the gang. This was just a trick to get into the mission. So the outlaws started riding for the mission. But just before they got there, they suddenly put spurs to their horses and rode on ahead. And they ducked their necks low over their horses, and Roy and Brimstone ride right into a piano wire that was stretched between two trees. And it caught them at the throat and dumped them off the horses. And they could be captured and killed now. Oh, I wonder what'll happen. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip by yo now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by yo Roy and Brimstone get to their feet. Roy looks up and sees the wire stretched between the two trees, and third picture top row says, Piano wire. And now I savvy why those two gunmen decoyed us this way. Brimstone exclaims. Yeah, no wonder they say the Sphinx's stronghold is tricked up like a carnival wheel. Last picture, top row, the two outlaws, Gusty and Al, ride into the mission and report to the Sphinx, who only talks in sign language. Gusty says, Hey, boss, the strangers claim to be bandits named Brimstone Barlow and Hogleg Harrison. The Sphinx makes a gesture, and Al replies, Hey, the Sphinx says you never heard of him, Gusty. First picture, bottom row, Gusty says... Hey, those strangers are coming inside. Let's trap them. They'll help us raid Pine City tomorrow if they're owl hoots. And if they're lawmen, they're dead men. The Sphinx makes another gesture, and Al says, hey, The Sphinx says okay. A little later, Roy and Brimstone ride up to the entrance of the outlaw's hideout. They dismount and walk toward the entrance. Brimstone says, Hey, we gotta get inside, Roy. Think of all the bad men in there that I can reform. Roy replies, Now wait, we're supposed to be outlaws. Go easy on trying to convert them right now, Brimstone. The gate is wide open, so Roy and Brimstone walk in. As they come through the gate, they don't see the outlaws who are hiding on either side of the gate. Then, last picture, the Sphinx pulls a lever. Hi, Roy, what the hell? What the Last picture, a trap door opens beneath them, and Roy and Brimstone are dropped into a pit. Gusty shouts... Welcome to the Sphinx's robber roost, gents. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how many tricks are those outlaws going to play on Roy and Brimstone? Well, I don't know, but if they keep up this rough treatment, Roy will be half dead before he has a chance to talk to the Sphinx. Do you suppose Roy will be able to make the Sphinx believe that he's really an outlaw? Well, if he does, he has to go on that ride to Pine City. Oh, I wonder what will happen. Well, maybe we'll find that out next week. Now let's turn over the page. And he's my favorite, too. So here we go with Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity-hoppity, make it a habit to give us music for old Br'er Rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Remus says, Br'er Fox is set on catching Br'er Rabbit, even if it takes three legs to do it. Today, the creatures at Briar Patch are having celebration with all kinds of games with prizes and everything. And one of the games is a three-legged race. Now, that's a race in which two people stand beside each other and tie the left leg of one person to the right leg of the other person. And that makes two people with three legs. That they call a three-legged race. As the creatures get ready for the race, tying their legs together, Burr Weasel and Burr Fox, hiding in the bushes nearby, watch. And Burr Fox says, hey, You see? They is practicing for the three-legged race. Burr Fox, who was anxious to have Burr Rabbit for supper, licks his chops and says, Hey, if us gets in that race, us pushes him into the woods, and then we get them both. So third picture top row, Burr Fox and Burr Weasel begin to tie their legs together. Burr Fox says, Get our legs tied, and we'll join the race when they passes us. Burr Weasel chortles, Yeah, we is gonna surprise him, huh? At that moment... Burr Sheriff, who has been standing behind a tree and was heard that little scheme, steps out of the bushes and taps Burr Weasel, last picture top row, on the shoulder. Burr Fox, who was still looking down the road, says, He's about to start. Burr Weasel, seeing the sheriff behind him, thinks to himself, 
Yeah, and so is I. In the other direction. And silently, Rare Weasel disappears into the bushes. Brer Sheriff picks up the rope, and first picture third row ties his right leg to Brer Fox's left leg. <coughs> Brer Fox, who is still keeping his eyes on Brer Rabbit, doesn't see this. Suddenly exclaims, Come on! There they go! And down the road, Brer Rabbit and Molly Cottontail run, giggling with the fun of running this funny kind of race. And behind him comes Brer Fox, who still hasn't noticed that he's tied to the sheriff instead of Brer Weasel. Faster! Faster! He's almost got him! Brer Fox and the sheriff catch up beside Brer Rabbit. Brer Fox reaches out to catch Brer Rabbit, but the sheriff keeps on going. Brer Fox looks back at Brer Rabbit and exclaims, Hey, 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 we had passed him! A second later, Brer Sheriff runs him into the county jail. <laughs> and last picture, Brer Rabbit and Molly Cottondale come up to the sheriff who is leaning against the door of the county jail. And Brer Rabbit says, Hey, look, we got a prize. And the sheriff with a big smile replies, Hey, yeah, and me too. And he points to the face of Brer Fox in the window of the jail. And they all hear Brer Fox saying, Now how in the world did this happen? And Uncle Remus says... You don't know whose side luck is on till you lose. (laughs) (laughs) That was a good joke on Bear Fox. He was so busy looking at Bear Rabbit and Molly Cottontail, he didn't even know what the sheriff was doing to him. Yes, he really got out Fox again, (laughs) didn't he? (laughs) Yes, he got out Fox again, and Bear Rabbit is safe, and that makes me happy. Me too. Now, that's all the time I have. I hope you have a nice Thanksgiving. Thank you. The same to you. And now, before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Connie Wiggy Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.